Okay, uh, hello everybody. This is a brief uh, supplementary lecture on memory. Uh, I wanted to do this because this is maybe one of the most important topics that we cover in this class in terms of both uh, things that you will use in the future. Uh, maybe it's not clear yet how you'll use it in the future, but we'll keep talking about these things, things you should know. Uh, also, in terms of uh, our course, uh, you will certainly use this again. Uh, so it is really important to try to make sure that you have a handle on this topic. So memory, uh, we're going to talk about this uh, drawing in a second. Memory overall, also pointers in C. I'm going to try to tie these two things together for you in this short lecture. So... Um, we discussed this in class, but basically when you talk about memory, uh, often the ways that you've talked about memory uh, in the past is probably in the context of some sort of data structure, probably an array. So if you have an array, uh, it doesn't matter what language you're using, doesn't matter if it's Java, C, whatever, uh, an array is basically a chunk of memory. Uh, we're used to talking about arrays as um, values and ind indexes. So you have some values in your array, uh, you have some indexes in your arrays, uh, and this is the uh, most easily mapped data structure to memory. An array is just a tiny chunk of memory that we've carved out. Often we will draw memory the same way we draw arrays. Uh, Instead of uh, indexes, you may give some address, in this case, zero to uh, whatever number, however big your array is, where um, each value is a byte. So this is the zeroth byte. You might have the, the first byte, second byte, third byte. Bytes are the smallest interactable uh, chunk of memory that you're able to modify through programming with some mild exceptions that aren't very important right now. So um, addressing is done by byte. Uh, so that's often why we write uh, addresses in hexadecimal like this. It makes it easier to represent. Uh, but the idea is the same. If you say this is a picture of memory and this is a picture of an array, you'll notice actually that they're incredibly similar. And that's because they an array is just a chunk of memory. So uh, we're going to talk about pointers uh, and how they're used in C and how we can use them in C. Uh, the most common takeaway in C is that arrays are pointers. This is how we use them. And I'm going to come back to this. But we want to know arrays are pointers. So um, for now, let's talk about how memory is structured more broadly. So if you have a program, your program has memory. Memory is laid out in a certain way. Uh, this is, we're, we're going to talk about this at a very high level. If you take a computer architecture or an operating systems class, you might talk about virtual memory and these things. Uh, and that will close some of the gaps that I'm not going to talk about. But let's just look at this broadly. Broadly, memory is laid out for a program, uh, you know, from some low address to some high address. Uh, and it's always laid out the same way. This is a convention. Programmers decided to do this. The people who designed your, um, your CPU, your operating system, your compiler, there's some sort of tacit agreement uh, between all these pieces that make this work. So at the bottom, of memory, you always have text. Text is actually just code. This is your program code. We'll talk more later in a later lecture, uh, but your program is code. Your functions have memory addresses. You can look at your code in memory. Uh, it's it's uh, sort of circular like that. Uh, the next we have what are basically constants, which I'm not gonna talk about very much Right, the second, but, but constants of some sort, uh, global variables, these sorts of things are above that. 
Uh, and then we have all of these features are mostly fixed. You don't change the code usually when you're running your program. Uh, constants or global variables, maybe you do change the value of a global variable, but the memory does not go away. The global variable is always there. Uh, and then we have the two dynamic regions, regions that change during your program execution, the size changes. The first is the stack. Um, the stack itself uh, is something that you've already used. Maybe you didn't realize you were using it, but when you write code, uh, you're using the stack. So in C, uh, we have um, font, we have functions. I'm going to clear off some of this board real quick so we have space to write. Feel free to roll back in this video if you need to see this uh, drawing again. Uh, but we're going to draw over it real quick. So in your code, you might have a function int main. Okay. Uh, now this function is called uh, implicitly when you start running your program. Some, something above your program is going to call main, okay? Each function call gets a place on the stack, okay? The stack is memory. Each function call has memory. So we would draw what we call a stack frame. Let's draw that a little bit bigger when we, because we're going to need some space here. We would have what we call a stack frame for main. So calling this function requires a little bit of memory. Um, likewise, when you declare local variables in main, maybe you have an int x, this takes a certain amount of memory. An integer in most languages is four bytes, or in most languages plus architectures. It's complicated how we decide what the size is, but 99% of the time, uh, it's going to be, we're going to have uh, four byte integers. So let's just assume that for now. So main then will need memory space for x. So there will be a chunk of memory in main designated for x. x will have a memory address. Uh, what that memory address is depends, but uh, it has, there's space here. And so if you give a value to x, you say x equals 5, uh, then you will have x equals 5 on your stack. There will be a memory address that says 5. The value is 5. Um, likewise, if we call a function, let's say we have a function foo, we will call foo. Then foo uh, will also get a stack frame. Once we call foo, when our program is here, we will draw a stack frame. Uh, maybe foo has its own int x as a variable. Um, and maybe we give it the value 15. So then in foo, we will have x, and it will have the value 15. And these two x's can exist at the same time because they have different memory addresses. They don't appear the same. The compiler can tell these local variables are different and allocate different memory to them. Uh, so that's kind of how the stack, that's how the stack works. The stack is how you use local variables. It's where this kind of memory comes from. The stack is for things that have a fixed size, generally. When you compile this, you know int x takes four bytes. Uh, and no matter how many variables you have, you can count how large this stack frame needs to be at compile time. There are other types of memory, what we call dynamically, dynamically allocated memory that um, you also use. So you've done this before. Uh, if you're used to doing Java, you've probably said new object, right? New object. This allocates memory on the heap. Um, the heap is for dynamic allocation. And the reason we call it dynamic allocation is we don't necessarily know how much memory we needed at the beginning. You could say new object array, 
uh, and have the size be a variable. You could give a variable in. What is in? Maybe we don't know in at compile time. So you could be asking for 10 bytes or a million bytes. Uh, if you tried to put this on the stack, we wouldn't know how big of a stack frame to make. So our program, our, our conventions would break down. So instead, we have a chunk of memory called the heap that we can just pull pieces off of and use dynamically. We can just grab a section of this heap um, when we need it. Later, we can free this. Uh, if you've been told about garbage collection, that's how freeing the memory works in Java. In C, we have to do it explicitly. You later have to call, uh, you know, well, well, we'll we'll talk about that in a second. So we'll talk about how we do dynamic allocation. So dynamic allocation in C is a little different. We don't have proper objects. Uh, we just have memory that we can use how we want. So in C, if you want to allocate memory, you would call malloc, which is memory allocator. Okay. And you say, I want 15 bytes. Uh, you give it the argument 15. It will give you a chunk of memory that is 15 bytes. Um, just the same way we allocated an array before, 15 bytes. Uh, so what we mean by we give you a chunk of memory, the way that we represent this is we represent it using a memory address. So uh, 15 is not a great number for this, so maybe let's do 12. So you could say int star x equals malloc 12. So int star, let's draw this more clearly, int star x, this is a type. This says int pointer, integer pointer. Uh, instead of a regular integer, this is a pointer to an integer x. Um, a pointer is just a memory address. So when you call malloc, uh, it's going to assign a memory address to x. Your, your system, your operating system, and your, your libraries keep track of what memory goes where so that you don't reuse it. So you can just trust you will get a good address back. Um, that memory is going to be shaped like an array. So x is going to point to a chunk of memory. That memory will have some address, f, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's f, or ff, uh, and it's going to go for 12 bytes. It will be 12 bytes long. So if you were to add 12 to this, you would get the end of the memory allocation. This is how we do arrays in C. 12 bytes is three integers. 12 divided by four is three integers. So we could store three values here. You can say x zero equals two, and it will put a two here, right? So um, broadly speaking, this is how this works. Uh, and now I want to show you how this looks on the stack. So when we do this, let's just make some space here. Let's make some space here. Um, let's just correct some, let's make a lot of space so we have room to use what we need. So we make some space. Uh, we're going to edit our main function to show a slightly different example. So in main, let's say we do, let's say we do what we just did. We do int star x equals malloc 12. What this is going to do is create, main has a stack frame, x is in the stack frame, x is going to be given some memory address, 0xff. Uh, well, it's probably not, well, it could be ff. It, it could be just about anything. It depends on where things line up. 
if it's FF, then that means that somewhere on the heap, there is memory address 0xff, and we're going to carve out a chunk of the heap to allocate 12 bytes. So this address is some address down here. It's some address in this heap. It tells us how to access memory at this location. Uh, so critically, that's how memory allocation and pointers work. It's just a memory address. It points to something else in memory. Uh, you've done this before. You've done things like this before. In Java, when you pass an object, uh, we often say Java will use pass by reference. What that means is you have some object down here some variable here that points to that object. And when you call a function, uh, it will just pass the memory address of the object instead of making a copy of the, ob of making a copy of the object. Uh, and that's efficient. We do that because it's efficient. If you had to copy this object, you would have to do a lot of memory access, and that would be very expensive. It's much easier to call foo and give it you know, your object and just have a pointer passed around. Pointers are 64 bytes um, or 32 bytes, depending on your system. A pointer is much smaller than an object. An object can, could contain an array of a million elements. Uh, making a copy of a million elements is not very cheap, so we use pointers, okay? So, uh, Two key syntactical things. So one, again, to have a pointer, to have a memory address, you say star. Uh, you don't have to always use malloc. There are some cases you want a memory address that for a variable that already exists. Maybe you have int x equals 5. And maybe you have int pointer, int star y. Uh, if you want y to point at x, then you would say, you would use what we call the address of operator, which is the ampersand. So you would say y equals the address of x. And now y points to 5, or y points to, to x. It points to the memory address of x. So um, a technique we can use, something we can do, is say, um, star x, so notice this is different, a little, this is a little different than how we used star up here, this isn't a declaration. We could say star x equals 15. In this case, the star is the dereferencing operator. So we had the address of operator, which is the ampersand that takes the address of some variable. And then we have uh, the star, which is dereferencing. It's saying, give me the value of whatever this y points to. Sorry, this should be y. So it says star y equals 15. Then if you were to go back and look at x, x would also be 15. We're changing the memory uh, that x represents, not the value of y. That is what the star y does. The same way you could do this, although it's a little odd because x isn't an array, you could also just write y zero, kind of pretending x is an array of one element, equals 15, and it would have the same result. x would also just be 15. Uh, so that's, kind of, that's how this works. Um, so we're going to look at some code examples real quick just to try to drive this home. So let's switch scenes. So here is our uh, terminal on Centaurus. Hopefully by now you're familiar a little bit with Centaurus. Let's take a look at the first example we have lined up. So this is an example just like the one we did on the board. We have an integer x. You'll note here that when we initialize x, we want it to be null. 
Null is the same thing as 0x0. Zero zero. Uh, we do this because x needs some value. If you don't give x a value, it will have some random whatever garbage was in memory stored in x. And so if you accidentally try to use x, uh, your program may not crash. You may just randomly modify some memory uh, and who knows what the consequences of that are. You don't want to randomly edit memory. We want to always know where our pointers point to. So since we haven't given it a value yet, we'll make it null. Um, to be clear, doing something like int star y semicolon, this is fine, this will compile. This is incredibly dangerous. Uh, if you don't have a value for y yet, you should make y null. You should do y equals null instead of uh, leaving ju just declaring it. This is what we call a dangling pointer. Very dangerous, hard to debug issues that come from this. If you say y equals null, when you declare it, um, program will crash if you do star y. Crashing sounds bad. Uh, in this case, crashing is a good thing. It helps you debug. Uh, in the case up here, your code will run. It will produce maybe the incorrect result, and you won't know why. It is much better for your program to crash um, and help you debug it than it is for your program to have really weird side effects that are hard to debug. So in any case, we have x here. Let's, let's look at our example. We have x here. We're going to malloc 12 bytes like we did in our example. Uh, you'll notice up here we have included standard lib.h. This is where malloc lives. This is the library that provides malloc. So you need standard lib.h to call malloc. Uh, and then finally, we're going to print out some values. We're going to, uh, let's unpack this statement. We're going to iterate i is less than 3. Remember, there's three integers and 12 bytes. We're going to take the address of x at index i. So what that means is we're going to treat x as an array, and we're going to print each element of x. Uh, not the value. We're going to print the pointer. So when we do this, we'll compile it. We'll get a pointers executable. We'll run pointers. What you'll find, and actually let's make this example even more robust. Let's make it a little more clear. We'll print the index out. Uh, so you'll see I just added um, the index to our print statement. We'll compile again. We'll run again. So x0, which is the same as x, has a memory address of 0x1714a0. The next integer in our array uh, is the same number plus four, an integer is four bytes. So it's four bytes away from our previous integer. And the same for two, it's just four more bytes away. Uh, and that's kind of how it works. Like I said, when you get, you'll get a memory address back and you just know that you asked for 12 bytes, so you own the next 12 bytes. And so your elements are these next 12 bytes. Uh, Likewise, we can look at another example. This example is a little more complicated. So what we'll see in this example is y equals 15. And then we have a pointer that points to y. We took the address of y. These two point to the same thing. Uh, so when we add some print statements here, we will see Let's just print everything so we can be super clear about what's going on here. We will print y, the value of y. We will print p, the value of p. And we will print uh, star p, which is p dereferenced. p is a pointer, so dereferencing p is legal. Uh, and then we're going to call this function foo. And then we're going to print all our values again. Same values, same print statements. 
foo takes an integer pointer argument and changes it. We say star x, so dereference x, plus equals 5. So you should think real quick for a second before we run this, what do we think the output of this program is going to be? Uh, well, y is 15, p should be the address of y, and star p, because p points to y, should also be 15. Um, and then we're going to pass in the address of y here, uh, and then we're going to print out y, p, and star p again. So let's see what happens here. Um, let's see what happens to our input. So we'll, we'll do gcc pointers2.c, print out pointers2, pointers2. And what happens here is we get a value. Uh, let's change it so that we print out y in, we'll print out y as an integer and not as a pointer. So let's try that one more time. What you'll see is y equals 15. Uh, we get some pointer, whatever the address, the stack address of y is. Uh, and then star p, of course, is 15, because p points to y. So dereferencing p gives us the same value as y. Uh, and then after we call our function, we see y equals 20. Uh, our memory address is the same, and star p is also 20. So to look back at the code, well, we passed in the address of y. We added 5 to the value of y. Uh, and then that was it. So 15 plus 5 is 20. And that explains how we got the answer that we got. Uh, so this is really sort of a high level view of C um, and pointers. This is how pointers work, how pointers interact with memory. Uh, all of it is very well defined. It works in a very specific way. Uh, I think pointers are often what people think are the scariest parts of C, and it's because you do need a little bit of this background uh, to understand this background, to understand why uh, pointers work the way they do, how exactly does memory work. Uh, and this hopefully has helped shed some light on that. Uh, we're going to keep talking about pointers uh, as for a little bit in class. Um, but I hope that this is helpful in some way. This is really the minimum you need to know about pointers to get started. So moving on from here, hopefully uh, we're able to do some more complex examples. Uh, we'll hope that uh, you can um, try some examples in class and we'll see how we go from here. Uh, but that's all for today. So thanks for watching uh, and we'll see you next time.